Hey besties, it's Dr. Madeline Wynn here again. I am actually here with one of my favorite people in the world, Dr. Kristen Lasico. She's an academic dermatologist based out of New York City and just the best, a hair specialist. Thank you. So literally this morning you texted me yeah. about you know, what happened at the Oscars and me like being completely oblivious to all things mm -hmm. pop culture was like, what, <laughs> what happened? And so we watched that. So let's watch it again now. And then, yeah, we'll chat about it. Let's do it. <laughs> I could, oh, okay. Yeah. Clearly really emotionally charged and, you know, obviously like a hard moment for everyone involved there. I but think like, that what was probably thoughts? a culmination of many things though. I don't think it was just about that one time mm -hmm. incident. I think mm -hmm. that reaction, well, not justified. I mean, obviously he could have handled that in other ways mm -hmm. rather than physically hitting him. However, that was likely a culmination of many things. Mm -hmm. And it, there was this parallel between him wanting to defend his family mm -hmm. and being nominated for an Oscar playing a father defending his children. Mm -hmm. And I think he spoke a little bit about that during yeah. his very emotional acceptance speech. Oh, yeah. I thought that was like very powerful how, you know, in that moment, he just like it was real and raw and like very, you know, like poignant on stage that, you know, he knew that he had let his emotions get the best of him. And another good another point is that Chris Rock did a documentary years ago called Good Hair. Mm -hmm. to increase awareness of black hair and black hair care specifically and how mm -hmm. important it is to black women. What the is it called? What is it called? Good hair. Good hair. Check it out, y'all. It is very good. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that he, and I'm sure that he, I don't think he had malintentions. Mm -hmm. I think he thought, you, you heard him say that actually. He mm -hmm. said that was a softball. Didn't he say that that was a softball? Mm -hmm. In his mind, it was a softball. Mm -hmm. It was something that People in comedy likely frequently do, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes above or below the belt jokes. Mm -hmm. um, that one likely fell below the belt, mm -hmm. and people felt it, mm -hmm. um, especially Will. Mm -hmm. um, you could see the reaction on Jada's face. Yeah, they oh, she was hurt by that. To her. You could tell. Yeah, you could you tell, could tell she was hurt by that. I mean, and it, especially since though, Jada has been very open about alopecia in general mm -hmm. and her journey with alopecia for several years now, actually. Yeah. And if I am getting into her head for a moment, she's probably thinking, I'm trying to push the needle forward mm -hmm. regarding alopecia, what it is, and the acceptance of all scalps, regardless of the presence or absence of hair. Right, right. And that joke brought us back a little bit. Mm -hmm. G.I. Jane shaved her head. Yeah. That was a reference to her not having hair. Right. And a reminder of her not having hair. Right. Um, it this was this autoimmune choice. condition that like, you know, doesn't really get enough, you know, recognition for the way that it affects everyone. Like, and it was her choice not to treat it. Right. It was yeah. her choice mm -hmm. to shave her head mm -hmm. and live her life mm -hmm. as normally as she would like, mm -hmm. normally as she would like. Mm -hmm. And that comment below the belt, I would feel like somebody was making me feel not normal. Mm -hmm. Right. Not yeah. having hair. That to me, that comment is not having hair is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there are going to be many opinions. I'm sure mm -hmm. there are going to be many opinions yeah. regarding the take on what this meant, how it was handled, and there'll be varying opinions. Yeah. I think that this happened at a time where it's something that can be used as a platform for good. Mm -hmm. And instead of people arguing about how it was handled, how it went down, mm -hmm. instead, I think that we can take a step back, come together, and actually use this to promote real change. Right. You know, I think the the advantage that people like you specifically have is having a presence, having a platform to do good. That's really nice of you to say, because I'm sitting here looking at you with heart eyes for everything <laughs> you're saying right now. I'm like, you're right. Yes. Like, <laughs> I wish I was you. Like, yeah, that... You're absolutely right, though. Like, it, it's like this privilege and this honor that, like, we can bring awareness to this through this very unfortunate incident this can really bring to light like the sh the the things that people with alopecia struggle with like this can really bring forward voices that have been you know silenced for quite some time because people do think of alopecia as you know just a condition of vanity i it hear that a lot actually i have many female patients who come to see me 
And one of the first things that come out of many people's mouth is, I feel vain for being here. No. And it's this sense of guilt, mm -hmm. feeling guilty that they've chosen to pursue treatment. Nobody should ever be felt to be made feel guilty, mm -hmm. whether they're seeking treatment or wanting to not seek treatment. Right. People should be accepted for who they are in their own skin. Right, right. And it is a condition. Like, it's a condition, so... And there are many types. Yeah, and there Alopecia. are many different types. There are so many different types, and it, it is a true, like, medical condition. And so, for it to be made light of, as if it's not as important as, you know, something else, like, an, like diabetes or another medical condition that affects your life, is just not right because it it's more than just the vanity. I mean, it affects every aspect of a person's life. And there yet. is research also to show that people with alopecia, including alopecia areata, are more likely to have anxiety, depression. We know that there are psychosocial burden with all types of alopecia. Right. Um, we know that people with alopecia areata, it is a true autoimmune condition. Yeah. And with what a, one autoimmune condition, you are more likely to have another. Right. There. Right. So this is not, but the difference, the difference between something that's internal, for example, are Arthritis. arthritis might not always have physical external changes, mm -hmm. external changes that are visible. Right. Right. Not everybody has contractures in their hands mm -hmm. and pain is something that oftentimes is internalized. Right. Right. You can't often see that. Yeah. Alopecia, you can mm -hmm. and people can't control that. Mm -hmm. But they're walking around as their most vulnerable self every day because their their medical condition is visible for the whole world to see. Yeah. And I think what I, I really applaud Jada for doing is trying to push the needle forward for acceptance. Right. Yeah. Acceptance for everyone, regardless of their skin type, regardless of their hair type. Mm -hmm. uh, curlier versus straight hair, right. um, presence or absence of hair, it shouldn't matter. People should be comfortable being themselves. Breach. <laughs> I have nothing of value to add to that because you absolutely put like everything like that I feel about this issue perfectly into words. Our society has you know, in a very healthy way, move towards prioritizing mental health a lot more. But what people don't realize is that people with alopecia, like that is, you know, I, I mean, that's, it's not just autoimmune and it's not just dermatologic. It's also, you know, psychosocial and that mental health aspect is there too. Like it's affecting multiple areas of a person's life. And it's like, it's a very globally debilitating Condition. And alopecia areata is present in up to 2% of the population. Yeah. That is not insignificant. Yeah. And alopecia in general is a very common, very common condition. Right. Right. And if we're combining all types of alopecia mm -hmm. together. And I, I think it, one, one, one phrase that comes to mind right now is carpe diem, is we need to, oh, sorry, don't <laughs> drink that water. It's been <laughs> contaminated with my hand now. <laughs> is carpe diem sees the day. Yeah. I think we can change this into something that can bring us close together and to seize the day for good. Seize the day to impact change. Right. And I not pull us apart. Bring us together. So like kind of on that same note, there's a bill that is going to be voted on in Congress soon. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I don't yeah. know too much about it. A HR 5430. Mm -hmm. I and three members of the New York City chapter of um, the Alopecia Riata Support Group through NAF or the National Alopecia Riata Foundation created a social media a campaign called um, Alopecia Justice League. Yeah. And this is something that is near and dear to my heart. We created the account and it's run by one of our uh, youngest members. Um, she's a force, force How to old be is reckoned she? with. Um, she's a teenager. Ooh, and, um, she's so young. <laughs> And already advocating, we love that for her. And yeah, she's a fierce advocate for this cause. Right. And our goal is to raise awareness of this bill, HR 5430, which is a bill that if passed would serve as Medicare as a platform to potentially cover wigs as cranial prostheses mm -hmm. as a true part of somebody's medical rehabilitation as part of their therapy plan. Right. So just to put into context, there are many types of wigs. Right. Synthetic hair, real hair, and wig cost can very greatly mm -hmm. from less than $100 to thousands of dollars. Right. And wigs are not covered oftentimes by insurance plans because again, alopecia is considered a cosmetic right. condition. Cosmetic. And so there oftentimes is lack of coverage and not everybody can afford wigs that are 
very expensive and right. more realistic looking. Right. And sometimes wearing a wig that is more obviously a wig mm -hmm. can sometimes bring more attention to somebody who has alopecia. And this breaks my heart and I hear this all too often. When women come in to my practice, oftentimes they're saying, People unsolicited have asked me, what is wrong with me? What is oh. wrong with me? Do I have cancer? Oh my God. And it breaks my heart that, it's like, I don't wanna get emotional about this, but. No, but I mean, it is like a very emotional subject. Like it's, it's something that people struggle with so often and like so, like potently and it's something that has unfortunately been made so light and like you being emotional about this right now just shows like how much you've seen, how much struggle you've seen in this and how much you actually care. And that's such a, an issue too, is that, you know, like out many of sight, patients, out of mind. Right. It shouldn't be. Right. Like people who don't struggle with alopecia don't really get it. And it's like very out of sight, out of mind for them. It's like, oh, well, whatever. Like. I'm fine. Like not out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. He doesn't. He, he's not experienced. He couldn't it. help it either. And you know, again, just is always like, okay, well, men. It's. I mean, it's even more like hard for them to sometimes cry. And he did that on national television in the midst of him getting an acceptance speech because, like, in that moment, that was not the most important thing. Like, he was too overcome with like the depth of the subject that was behind everything. Right. And no. I'm back here with my water. <laughs> that that's my co-resident. She refuses to be on camera. <laughs> but she has a lot to say about this too. And we had to take a bit of a brief intermission to, you know, like cool the camera battery down <laughs> as well as cool ourselves down because like I mean you got emotional there, but it shows how much of an issue this truly is. Like and my co-resident was just saying how you know, as a doctor, we're privy to a person and a patient's most vulnerable moments and most intimate insecurities. And, you know, like we truly care. Like when we open our, like we take that home with us. Like when we open ourselves up to a patient the way they open themselves up to us, we carry that emotion with us and we bring it home. And like Dr. Losico is like truly like putting all of her heart and her soul into this. And, and it's just heartbreaking to see that even after all this pain that this condition can cause people, there are still people out there who are out of sight, out of mind, and just don't care about it and don't care because it's not happening to them and minimize it. I think that's the big thing is like minimizing it. And it's not even just like people like outside of medicine. There are people in medicine as well who do that. And it can be really hard. Oh! <laughs> so we're having technical difficulties here. This is a very we will not be silenced. <laughs> we will not be silenced. We will not be silenced. <laughs> you cannot turn the light off on us. We will turn it back on. That's right. Our light will shine. That's right. There you go. This is all metaphorical. That was the the lights are a paid actor. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think mean, you hit the nail on the head, though, when you said feeling minimized. Yeah, um, I, I think that is a general that is a general theme mm -hmm. that people feel that their hair loss has been minimized. I've had women come in and tell me that um, they had seen another medical provider who said, you know, what are you talking about? You have hair on your head. What are you talking about? You should feel grateful that you don't have cancer. And just when, just when I think that, just when I think like that, I've heard it all, I haven't. And yeah. someone comes in with a different, you know, a, some other struggle um, specifically related to their hair loss. And I think one thing that I want to reiterate is that if we don't all think out of sight, out of mind, that will help to push the needle forward. You don't have to specifically suffer from hair loss to empathize with somebody who is struggling. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes through their own struggle. Mm -hmm. at, and there are many people who have likely had their sense of self taken from them yeah. in many different contexts. Right. You know, being afraid of wanting to show people themselves. And um, I think if we could better understand that and better embody that, I think we'd be able to have more productive conversations with people. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why I get so emotional because 
you know, bring me back to residency. I was very fortunate to have, you know, to have a mentor who focused on, on alopecia. I'm very fortunate to have a mentor of where I am now, who's a world's leading expert in alopecia. And oftentimes, um, early in my residency, I would always, um, the patients who had struggled with alopecia, regardless of the cause, would come in very upset with iterations of uh, the general theme of feeling of feeling unheard, of feeling unseen, of feeling right. minimized, right? right? Not potentially by even by other clinicians, by their own family members sometimes. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, and how is someone supposed to feel brave enough to seek care if they don't have adequate support surrounding them? Right. And that's why, that's why I don't want this to be out of sight, out of mind. Right. And you said that uh, the average alopecia patient, on average, does not present to the clinic to seek help for their alopecia until over a year. Over a year after starting to notice that they have this condition. And there are many reasons for this. Right. One is probably people feel embarrassed. They feel like this is vanity. And that's not. Those sentiments are, are further perpetuated by external forces. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go back to residency for a second because when people were coming in feeling unseen, unheard, I felt a drive to want to advocate for a group of people who needed a voice. Right. Well, lucky them because they got the best voice <laughs> right here. No, really, like they're the alopecia movement is so extremely lucky to have you. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a great, a great community. And uh, I just want to reiterate that, you know, we are strength in numbers and that any one person can make a difference. And I know I'm only one person, but I think the more people we can bring together, the more strength we have. Right. You know, our light will shine brighter when we're not alone. Yeah. And I think that's how we can impact true change. That's lasting, right? This is not just a conversation to be had for today right. and to be forgotten about. But I think this happened for a reason for us to use this platform for good mm -hmm. and to impact lasting change, not something that's fleeting. Right. And that's one of the main reasons why I get so emotional because this is such a passion of mine because I have chosen to, you know, to focus my practice um, on this population of people for this reason, because they need a voice. They need someone to advocate for them and we can be those advocates not just as their clinicians and dermatologists, but to impact great change for people around us as well. And, you know, without support for NAF or the National Alopecia Arata Foundation and other foundations that support hair, hair loss research, we won't be able to find cures. That's actually a really good point in that alopecia areata currently doesn't have a cure. Not only that, mm -hmm. but to date, there is not one FDA approved medication to treat alopecia areata, not one. And the reasoning behind that? Well, one of it, fortunately, in, in the last decade, we have made huge strides, and, and I use the term not lightly, quote unquote, game changers. Mm -hmm. The JAK inhibitor medicines, and that stands for Janase kinase, JAK inhibitor medicines have been truly game changing for people with these conditions, especially the more severe types of alopecia areata mm -hmm. that can cause uh, hair loss, not just on the scalp, but on the face, lashes, brows, nose hair, and in the total body as well. Mm -hmm. Somebody might laugh when I say nose hair, but nose hairs are there for a reason. Yeah. Eyelashes, eyelashes are there for a reason. Right. They're there to protect our eyes and people mm -hmm. often don't think about it. Mm -hmm. But if your eyelashes aren't there, you're more likely to have debris and other things enter your eyeballs. They're, they're, right. they're there for a functional reason. Right. Everything serves a purpose. Um, the human body is a phenomenal enigma. Right. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and uh, I'm just really grateful to have the health that I do have. Right. If because I think we know sometimes a little bit too much of the things that could go that wrong. Could go right, yes. um, and you know, seeing people who are, you know, who are ill and at their most vulnerable states really reminds us of how lucky we are, mm -hmm. not only for our own health, but to be given the privilege to actually treat people. Right, and to advocate um, for them. And to advocate for them, and to, to do the them. research. Right. To do the research, because without research, 
we can't develop novel therapies and continue our understanding of medical conditions like alopecia areata Absolutely, without yeah. that we also can't move the needle forward mm -hmm. to treat people mm -hmm. right so the conversation should lead us in multiple directions right not just social acceptance but mm -hmm. support for research bring all of this together right right so and we like can... this movement any movement really it doesn't need like one perfect advocate it needs like millions of imperfect advocates trying their best we're to move imperfect. that needle forward. Exactly. Yeah, we're all imperfect. We're all imperfect. And but that's the thing is like you don't have to like be doing every single thing. Like you don't have to do research and have to like make a speech on stage or make a video about something like this. But it's, here's one thing you can do, mm -hmm. right? Go on Google, mm -hmm. type in who is my local representative mm -hmm. and write them a letter for that bill. Mm -hmm. Right. If you feel and strongly that's HR, about that, HR 5430, 5430, right? HR 5430. It, um, you know, to give people a sense of control back, to give right. us a pe people a sense of dignity mm -hmm. when it has been stripped from them. It mm -hmm. has been robbed from them. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rosico. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is truly so eye-opening and like helpful and your patients are just so lucky to have you like to have you not only advocating for them here at an annual dermatology meeting but also like advocating for them behind the scenes with the with the congress bill and um with your research and i mean clearly you just care so much and i hope that all of you watching can like feel how real this is and understand that it's not something to be made light of and this controversy surrounding the oscars now the, as she said there's going to be a lot of opinions surrounding no at the end of the day there is no bad guy here right right will smith not a bad guy chris rock not a bad guy there was no malintention i think right the we reactions were as such right because mm -hmm. it was it hit to hard mm -hmm. and I mean, you could also see Chris Rock's reaction mm -hmm. as well, too. Mm -hmm. I think his reaction reiterated the fact that he did think that it was not malintentioned. Mm -hmm. I think that if he if he did think that, he wouldn't have said it. Mm -hmm. And so th there is no pointing fingers at either side mm -hmm. if we want to make this a productive conversation. Right. Absolutely. I think using it as an opportunity to shine light and create more awareness. And as my co-resident was saying earlier, <laughs> it's creating this conversation that maybe will help people stop and think that next time when they see someone walking around with less hair on their head, that they don't just automatically stigmatize them or, you know, like give them unsolicited advice or yeah. stare at them or minimize their concerns as being vain or just cosmetic because yeah. it i mean it's a real thing and y you saw here first <laughs> like it's a real thing and i just want to thank you for joining us today and you know sharing your thoughts on this and i hope all of you watching today can you know take a step back and take this in and maybe rethink how you approach this condition as well as you know what you can do to help and to have courage. Mm -hmm. I think I needed courage because initially I didn't want to do this interview out of fear. <laughs> um, but I think it's it's only timely in that as I gathered the courage and you helped me to gather the courage <laughs> to get in front of a camera and speak from the heart and be raw and unedited to give people courage to change. Mm -hmm. give people the courage to seek care if that's what they want mm -hmm. and to give people courage to be them true their true selves right with or without hair and that's exactly what you just said if any of you out there are struggling with this condition and feeling minimized or feeling like you can't seek help just do it like it's not vain it's it's you it's affecting you and you should feel validated in your struggles because as we were saying earlier, everyone struggles with something and not all of our struggles are going to be the same, but that doesn't make any of them any less valid. Well said. Thank you. You're fantastic. You're fantastic.
<laughs> and um, my co resident as well. But oh, yay! Oh, all right. Right. Yay. I feel bad. They said I needed to have courage, and I'm like, okay, yay. all right, because I appreciate these women so much, and hair loss is obviously really important for me, even though I'm speaking from behind the camera, but they're encouraging me to be courageous, so. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah. It's the same way that you guys can all try to keep understanding this topic more. Yeah. Oh. Surround yourself with powerful women. That is all. Bye-bye.